Meet Reed Lance Rosenthal, rancher, number one best-selling award-winning author, and unabashedly, unapologetically, on the right side of the outstanding issues of our generation. But don't try to fence him in. Sometimes his positions will surprise you, because Reed is definitely his own man, with his own opinions. You might love him, you might hate him, but you won't be able to stop listening. Step over to the right side with Reed. This is Reed Lance Rosenthal on the Right Side Radio. KGAB AM 650 in the Town Square Network serving the Intermountain West and Easy 101 Colorado Springs serving Southern Colorado, Northern New Mexico and 780 AM The Monster out of Denver. Hello Rocky Mountains, Nebraska to Utah, Montana to New Mexico. We have a great show today. John Laboudier. He is a number one best-selling New York Times author. Uh, He has some great books. We're going to be talking about them during the course of the interview. We're going to be talking a little bit today about the international situation, Iran and Syria, how that ties in because of the energy consequences and cost consequences to what's happening right now in this rather dysfunctional government we have with the shutdown, the debt ceiling, uh, potential debacle coming our way. We're going to discuss what the Republicans have done wrong, what they've done right, and the absolute outrageous, should we say, manipulation of the shutdown to cause the most pain, all of it avoidable. John Lee Boudier Boudier has joined us. Uh, John, by the way, uh, has a rather illustrious career. Number one, he's a Magna Cum Laude graduate of Harvard, and he's written a book, in fact, Harvard Hates America, which is kind of humorous. I've breezed through it, haven't read it in depth, but I was chuckling, i got to tell you, uh, John, uh, through many passages. And uh, he is also a host, along with Pat Goodell, on the Political Insiders on Fox, 3.30 Eastern Time on your Fox channels. I suggest you watch that show. It's insightful and a great, uh, great panel of hosts there. He's also been a host on ABC Talk Radio. Uh, he has had his own Sunday morning show on WPLJ. He's hosted other shows on WABC. He's written The Obama Identity, a novel, or is it? I love that title, John, i got to tell you. And uh, he also is a political co- columnist for Newsmax. Uh, his website, by the way, is John Laboot, L-E-B-O-U-T dot com. That's John Laboot. Dot com, So you can look them up and uh, be as impressed as I am with them. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, John. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. Good afternoon. You know, uh, the show is timely because uh, these are some of your areas of expertise, and we have just a royal friggin' mess going on, not only domestically but internationally. I think we'll start the show because I think the two are interrelated. Because in Obama's world, I think you'll agree, everything is politics. Nothing, nothing is really American values. Nothing is really American people. It's all ideology and politics. Whichever ways the polls drive his next conquest of congressional seats is the way he will go. Full speed ahead, the people be damned. Um, in Iran and Syria, number one, what, what is your opinion uh, of our sudden willingness to sit down with the Iranians because we have a new Iranian president who is a quote unquote moderate and smiles a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm worried that Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry are too eager to make a deal. That Obama has had so many things go badly for him, including a month ago. The whole Syrian escapade where he wanted to get permission from Congress to bomb Syria. Congress was going to probably give it to him, but the American public spoke up and said, N-O, and told their representatives, their senators, and the president, we're not doing it. We're not getting mired in another place over in the Middle East. And that was 65% of the people, Reed, telling the elected officials, don't do it. Well, not, and, not, not only that, John, I mean, we had the whole embarrassment of him drawing of the quote-unquote red line, and then, I mean, as uh, if we don't have videos or memories saying that he never said it. 
There's really that, the red you know, line of the international point. community. Right. It's amazing how he could sit there that day about a, three weeks ago say, I didn't draw the red line. The world community drove it. Well, that's not true. We have him on tape last August 20, 2012, right during the beginning of the Republican convention in Tampa. The president was in the White House, and I think he was looking for attention, you know, and because he was worried that the Republicans were getting all the attention. So he, he pulled out Mr. Tough Guy and drew the red line without ever thinking it through and without getting his ally or allies on board with us. And here we were a year later. Uh, Assad violated that red line a dozen times in the last year. And when the president tried to do something about it, the American people said no. And I, I think because of that, that was the low point of this year for Obama, September. His poll ratings were terrible after that. And because of that, I think he's now gone the other direction with the Iranians, and instead of getting tough, he's getting soft again. And he wants to make a deal for deal's sake, so does Kerry. They don't like the fact that Putin upstaged them in Syria. So now they're looking for something where they can look like they're the big heroes. Well, he, he, I and mean, it's, listen, it's a Putin, bad deal. Putin made him look like fools all the way through. What most people don't know is that the Security Council resolution to quote unquote disarm Syria of its chemical weapons, as if that's going to happen 100 percent. Uh, right. it, 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 it's a, it's a resolution that means nothing. The, within the resolution, it requires the Security Council to meet again to approve any forceful action that would be taken in the event Syria does not fully comply. Obviously, with China and Russia on the Security Council, that will never be granted. We're right back to square one. I know. I mean, it's really pathetic. Uh, and most people don't know that because, of course, the mainstream media just won't tell them. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the whole the whole thing is a charade and, and uh, you know, the puff of a puff adder is what it is. It is not... Yep. It is not the flared neck of a cobra. So now we're in, now we're into Iran. So we have we have a new Iranian president who everybody says is moderate by everybody, the mainstream media and the Obama administration. Uh, of course, they said the same thing about the Muslim Brotherhood too. And <laughs> we, and we we have a uh, we have an Iranian president who wrote a book. Folks can look this up online. He wrote a book in which he chortled about how he schnookered the West when he was the hmm. chief Iranian arms negotiator from 2003 to 2005. I think the exact words were, and while they sat at the table, the centrifuges kept spinning. Oh, my God. I mean, it's right in his book. It's frightening. It's in black and, and white. Yeah, it is frightening because the centrifuges are spinning right the second, and uh, we are biding our time, and talking about lifting the sanctions and making a deal and blah, blah, and we're going to wake up one day and they're going to have an operational nuclear weapons. They'll be a member of the nuclear club. And when you're in that club, Reed, we've all seen it. Once you're in there, you're treated differently than you were before you got in. And that's well, listen, where they're headed. You know, you, you and know, we let it happen. It's not only that, but if you read, if you read this book, <clears throat> written by the mouthpiece we're now, quote-unquote, negotiating with. He talks about the fact that his next schnooker of the West is going to be uh, basically telling the West that, yes, you know, we're, we're not going to enrich uranium to the point, 20% enrichment, which would allow us to build nuclear bombs. However, we're going we're gonna to enrich uranium before, quote-unquote, peaceful purposes to 3%. And we're going to stockpile all that extra enriched 3% uranium. He then goes on in his book, I really encourage people to, I mean, obviously the Obama administration has either not read the book, don't care to read the book, or maybe they've read the book and, and, and figured that most people won't. He then talks about the fact that it takes a matter of a month to go from 3% enrichment to 20% enrichment, and at that point, they'll have a stockpile of enough uranium for 20 to 30 nuclear devices. So this guy has the whole chess game thought out. You know, Kerry and Obama are playing checkers. This guy is playing three-dimensional chess. Yeah. 
Well, it's it's scariest thing. I mean, really. Uh, let, let me ask and, a question. What, what, yeah. Let, let, let me ask a question, John. If I if I may, sorry to interrupt you. What do you think Israel is going to do about this? Uh, well, that's that's the good thing. It, they made it very clear again last Tuesday, a week ago, today. Netanyahu at the UN stated it unequivocally. Iran will not be allowed to get a nuclear weapon, even if they have to do it on their own, it being attack, bomb, blow up, sabotage, whatever they're going to do, they're going to do it. Uh, They'd rather do it with the United States. Um, We don't know what their agreement is between Obama and Netanyahu about this. But Israel will not let Tehran get nuclear weapons because Tehran has repeatedly said Israel is an illegitimate state and belongs cleansed and and they belong having a mushroom cloud over it. And the Israelis are not going to risk a second holocaust. They're just not going to do it. And I don't blame them one bit. Let me ask, I have a theory on this. Tell me what you what you think. I think that, you know, we have dithered the world has dithered here now for almost a decade while Iran has been on its merry way. They've had 10 years to encase and fortify their enrichment program. <clears throat> uh, from what I've read, in some cases, 400 feet underground, tons of concrete, etc. I mean, it's almost beyond the capabilities of any conventional weapon to destroy. And my personal opinion is I don't think Israel is that worried because I think Israel will take them out with tactical nuclear weapons. Well, I think that I had read that we have built a bunker buster bomb and that will penetrate these bunkers and and would work, and we have given or lent or sold or somehow transferred these things to Israel. But I'm, I've read that, so who knows if it's true? But yeah, supposedly. Hey, 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 listen, if they have to, if they have to use tactical nukes to to wipe out the Iranian nuclear program, they'll do it. Now, the, what I'm hoping happened last week was Obama and Netanyahu met in the Oval Office on Monday. Tuesday, Netanyahu makes this incendiary speech at the UN, which I found very compelling. Uh, talking about the history of the Jews and the wipeout and the Holocaust and how they're never going to let it happen again and how no matter what, he won't let it happen again. That was all really good. Then it makes you wonder, was that speech by Netanyahu part of a good cop, bad cop duo that he and Obama are going to work, which is Obama will negotiate with the Iranians. He'll be the good cop. He'll offer lifting the sanctions, blah, blah, but we've got to have inspections, and we've got to be good, the U.N., all this and that. But if you don't do it, I cannot hold off this crazy Netanyahu. He's going to come bomb the hell out of you. And you know, that, that, you know, I, think, I think the proof of the pudding there, John, is going to be whether the so-called agreement, if one is ever reached, and I doubt it will be, is whether Iran will stop enrichment to the three percent level, particularly yeah. given a book by the Iranian president talking about that's the key step to getting to a nuclear bomb, not from four percent to twenty percent. Right. So well, but know, here's Net- the thing. I mean, I don't know. Net- and Net- 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 talked about that. There have to be inspections to determine that, and will they allow inspections? Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Are they going to allow U.N. inspectors? I know they've already said they can't be American inspectors. And and I don't think America would insist that it would be, but it would have to be from the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, would have to be able to go in there unfettered whenever they wanted and inspect whatever they want. You know, if they're going to allow that, if they allow it and we are satisfied, and I mean we being the five European nations and the United States are all satisfied that they're not enriching to that level, then maybe we, maybe we could get somewhere. The, uh, the bunker buster bombs are 40,000 pound devices, which <clears throat> the U.S. military says have a 60% chance 
by the way, of penetrating Iran's defenses. And uh, with a 60% chance and the fate of his nation and an entire people resting on it, I'm not sure Netanyahu is going to take a chance, because I think you're only going to get one shot, no pun intended. Well, that's, but that's just that. I mean, they have, they've got agents in place in Iran. If you recall, a couple of years ago, mysteriously, an entire Iranian base disappeared as if it imploded into the ground. And it's never, obviously we'll never find out, well, not as long as that government's in place, what happened. But the suspicion is Israel did something on the ground to blow the place up, and the Iranians don't want to broadcast that because they're embarrassed over it. I mean, it, the Israelis are very clever about this, and it's not just high-level bombing. They'll figure out how it's got to be done if they have to have People on the ground go in there and blow it up. They'll do it. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. Let's 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 spend a minute and talk about what the result of that kind of conflict might be on America and the American economy in several different respects. Which I think is a perfect segue into the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know, the Jane Eyre novel playing out in Washington right now. So let's say the worst comes to worst. No agreement is reached. Israel acts in one way, shape, or form. The nuclear facilities are destroyed or partially destroyed. What, in your opinion, happens then? Within a day, Reed, uh, uh, oil goes to 300 a barrel. I agree. Gas at the pump, six, seven bucks a gallon pretty quickly. I mean, it, this will have a devastating effect on our economy, uh, Japan's economy, Western Europe, uh, Europe's economy, all of it. Uh, they, the Iranians, um, well, first let's stick with the oil. The Saudis, everybody else, the whole thing with the Straits of Hormuz, any excuse they can have to raise the price of oil they're going to use. And that thing's going up. Our economy's slowing down right away, which is not good because our economy is so bad at, at the moment anyway. So that's the first thing that happens. Then there is blowback. You know, do the Iranians, with their vast terror network and Hezbollah, Hamas, all these terrorist groups, do they put the word out? They, in effect, do they put a fatwa out on Americans to start blowing up airplanes, restaurants, hotels, whatever it is where Americans are? You know, worldwide terror against America as payback for doing this thing. Oh, I think we can count I, I on it. I think anything you know, like that could happen. But far better, far better terrorism with conventional weapons than international terrorism with a nuclear bomb. No, oh, boy, you're not kidding. Because there's no doubt in my mind that if they come, if they if they manufacture a nuclear device, uh, either they will deliver it one way or the other, perhaps surreptitiously, or they will sell it to an agent. They are the largest exporters of terror on the planet to an agent who will get it across what we call a border, which is really a sieve, and then we will have a true catastrophe in the United States. Yeah. Well, you what? have to assume the worst. So you have to assume that's what could happen, it might happen, and plan accordingly and try to prevent it. And I think that's what's going to happen. We're not going to let it happen. And why do you think, John, because this goes right into the American economy, the... The, uh, the game of chicken being played right now over the default, <clears throat> the government shutdown, the politics being played. Uh, why do you think, since you have to plan for the worst, and as the so-called president, <clears throat> that's kind of your job, is to plan for the worst to protect the American people, why aren't we pulling out all the stops we can, including Keystone, the whole nine yards, so that we are energy independent, so that that kind of aftershock from an event which one way or the other, I think, and I think I hear you saying that we agree is going to happen, why would we not be getting ourselves prepared so that the problem of oil in the Middle East is really not our problem? What, what do you ascribe that to? Uh, liberalism. <laughs> you know, Obama, I mean, why he wouldn't build Keystone, why he wouldn't put... 
the full court push on to, to do more drilling here at home. It, it's typical of the liberals. They'd rather cut down overall use of oil than they would try to increase domestic production. And all you ever hear from this guy is that we've never produced more than we're producing right now, which may be true. I don't know, but well, actually, it is that, true. That doesn't that, answer the question. But eighty-seven percent of that production is on private land, since he has engineered a forty-six percent decrease of oil production on federal lands. I mean, right. just another kind of material omission in his long list of material omissions. So, <clears throat> do you see a more devious intent? on his and his minions behalf or simply liberalism uh liberalism and incompetence i I don't think it's devious so much i I just think that these guys are in way over their head and his second term is already sort of a floundering flop there's nothing going on he can't get anything done we have the thing going on in washington now the debt ceiling and the budget shut down, and he can't get a handle on it, and the Republicans can't either, by the way, but it just shows why the American people have completely lost faith in the whole thing. They don't believe in the two parties. They don't believe in their party. They don't believe in any of it. I would agree. Of course, you know, he is able to open up the uh, the Washington Mall for an immigration uh, get together tomorrow, though the memorials remain closed to World War II vets. So he can get some things done to inflict pain when he wants to, which kind of brings us to the current morass in the Capitol. So why don't you give us your, number one, your overall kind of view, and then let's get into some specifics. Well, first of all, the thing, I, I, I'm really amazed at this thing, that, that my fellow conservatives shut the government down in an attempt to stop Obamacare without really thinking through how this was going to work. Because Obamacare has been been put into effect by Democrats, totally. Not by Republicans, by Democrats. And in order to get rid of it, at the moment, you're going to have to get Democrats to agree to get rid of it. They, they're going to have to defund it. Yeah, the House, we could do it just with Republican votes, but to get the Senate to do it, you got to get Democratic senators to vote for it. Not only that, you they aren't going to override a veto. Override a veto. And to override a veto. So, but the one thing you could do, if we'd done it right beginning, say, in May and June, was set out to make a one-year delay our goal. And the reason I want to delay it a year would be you delay it one year, and maybe you can delay it another year. But you delay one year through the congressional elections next year, who knows what's going to happen? We might win the Senate back. Well, not only and now that, if we no. have both the House and the Senate, we're in the driver's seat on this thing. Yeah, no, I, so, I, happen, to, I happen to agree with you 100%. And, yeah. you know, we had the perfect lever in that Obama illegally and unilaterally granted the one-year uh, deferral to business. I mean, employers exactly. are getting so, so that's employers the, are that's getting the, the predicate, right? I mean, he so set up say the, to the he country, set, but, but in order to do it, Reed, we have to do a couple other things. We have to have hearings that we didn't have all summer on the IRS and the corruption in the IRS, the lies in the IRS, to set up the argument to the public, which is we've got to delay Obamacare. A, as you just said, Obama opened up the delay by doing it to the business mandate. So it's only fair to do it to the individual mandate. Delay for a year, number one. Number two, the IRS is the agency monitoring and, in effect, running Obamacare, and we've proven through these hearings that they're a corrupt mess. Who would dare trust them? to run Obamacare, so let us delay while we get a different agency staffed up to monitor Obamacare. And three, it's not ready to be implemented on October 1st. We're now on October 8th. We're one weekend. And haven't we seen already what a fiasco this thing is? The websites don't work. People can't sign up. The administration won't admit how few people have actually signed up for this thing. 
Yes, I, I got it. I got it. Logical screw up. I I, I got to interrupt here and tell you, you know, the fact that the that the administration, Obama, who proudly who proudly said, sure, label it Obamacare, that they will not come out with their enrollment numbers. I mean, right. flatly exactly. refused to come out with their enrollment numbers in the face of major insurance company executives when questioned, even by mainstream media, saying, "Of course they know when everybody signed. They they have those reports like by by the minute." Right. There have been some reports. I don't know if you've read these, though. I'm going to have them posted on the website. I post uh, articles that go along with each show to give people more reading material and some backup for what I and my guests have <clears throat> have discussed. And I'll be posting these articles, but the insurance commissioners in a number of states have revealed the numbers. Do you know how many people signed up on day one of Obamacare in California? No. 755. Do you, remember, you, know, you know who signed up in South Carolina? 100. One. Uh, one. One. <laughs> one person. Yeah. So no wonder they don't want to come out with these numbers. Instead, yeah. they're crowing about, and I'm sure everybody's heard it, you know, 8.2 million people have visited the website. I mean, hell, I visited the website four times just to take a look at it. Yeah. I'm sure there's several million of me out there. So, you know, the whole thing is a farce and a charade. What do you think is prompting? I mean, let's talk a little bit about psychology. It's surmise. But what is prompting the intractability of Obama and his minions in what is really kind of just a common sense approach? If you're truly well, interested all, he, about lowering he, he, costs he, he, and, and the health care system. All right, because he got reelected, though. So he really doesn't care. He doesn't have to get reelected. Um, doesn't ever have to run again. He's very arrogant anyway. He's even more arrogant now. So his attitude is, I will do whatever I want. And I got burned the last time I tried to negotiate with these repubs. I'm not doing it again. But I think he's going to come off that, Reed. I think that in America, what they don't like about Republicans often is our obstinacy in that we believe in principles and we stick to them no matter what. That's what we believe, but most Americans look at that and say, you're stuck in the mud, you're not flexible enough. You're not practical and pragmatic enough. Get the thing done. That's what the people think. Similarly, now they're looking at Obama, and all he ever says is, I will not negotiate, I will not negotiate. Well, guess what? That is intractable and obstinate, and they don't like that about him either. I love the way he tries to fluff it like he did the red line in Syria by saying, but of course I have offered to negotiate many times over the last seven months, and I'd be happy to negotiate if they just cave right now. Yeah, I mean, it's really it's kind of like a red line moment, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, well, he's, he's Mr. Red Line, isn't he? <laughs> He is Mr. Redline. So yeah. <clears throat> you think that the polls will start to swing the opposite way? No, I think the polls are showing that they're blaming both. They're blaming the Republicans a little bit more than the Democrats and, and more than Obama so far. So far. He's getting off better than the other two, the two parties are. But we've got a long couple weeks to go or at least eight days nine days till the debt ceiling deadline of october 17th which is not a hard and fast deadline but they don't want to get too close to that deadline without showing some progress because the markets are going to start to go down and politicians hate it when they're donors and they're rich supporters and this applies to democrats and republicans they start calling these guys up screaming at them you're costing me money you better get this thing settled. You know, they're going to listen to that. I think the whole thing is, you know, another political machination. I, I don't know if you had occasion to see the Mike Wallace interview of Jack Lew last Sunday. I'm going to have it posted There's on Chris that. Wallace. Yeah, Chris, uh, Wallace, Chris Wallace, yeah. excuse me. Chris yeah. Wallace with, with yeah. Jack Lew uh, last yeah. Sunday. I'm going to have it posted on the website with your show, and people should really, really, really watch that interview. I thought Chris did a terrific job, and Jack Lew was, even to the most unbiased uh, or the most biased lefty observer, had to, had, to, had to appear as squirming, contradictory, 
uh, absolutely without substance in his responses, which leads me to believe, as you just said, that I think you know this October seventeenth date is kind of you know the manufacture of a crisis. And most people don't know is that you know there's wide latitude to the government, even in the, even if the debt ceiling is not raised, to allocate the expenditure right. of funds. I mean, there is no reason in the world, unless Obama won't sign the paper, that we default on anything to any foreign country or on our debt. Other things may have to go by the wayside, but a default is absolutely avoidable. Of course, they don't they don't tell the public that. Right. Yep, no, you're right. You're right. I think so, we're in for a rocky October, Reed. I think it's going to be... I, I think that they we're nowhere near settling this thing. Um, I, I, I don't think the Republicans really know what it is they want. They wanted the Obamacare defunding, say. Well, they were never going to get that. That's why I disagreed with the way they went about it. They share their passion against Obamacare, but you got to be smart about how you try to do things. And if they'd pushed delay instead of defund, they might have gotten somewhere. We have one Democratic senator who said, I'll vote for delay. But they needed to get six or seven of them. And they would have gotten them if they'd pushed that all summer long. Here we are with the government now shut down. We're not getting defund. We're not going to get delay. Most of these congressmen aren't even talking about Obamacare anymore. They've moved over now talking about debt and spending and the debt ceiling. And I don't really know what it is they want. You know, the debt it's ceiling, changing, you know? The, the debt ceiling I think, uh, resonates far more with the public in terms of a Republican issue than does the government shutdown, which, you know, you and I just completely agree on that whole it was just bad strategy. Um, but the debt ceiling, a new poll just came out, I believe it was just a day or two ago. You know, it's a Fox poll, yeah. Yeah, 66% of the people think the debt ceiling should not be, be raised. Now, you right. know, that, that is a large plurality of the voting public. And uh, I, would, I would think the, the faster Republicans can, can shift their focus – away from Obamacare, which, of course, the Democrats are desperately trying to keep it linked to, um, and into, you know, number one, these eight, they've, passed, they've passed eight CRs right now, which fund the parks, the uh, CDC, Border Patrol, you know, the memorials, uh, kids' cancer research, et cetera, all of which are, are languishing, as everything does, when Harry Reid's desk at Obama's behest. And I think if that word slowly seeps out, that these problems that are being caused, you know, everywhere from, from, uh, shall we say, the, the subjective deeming of essential by Obama <clears throat> to cr create the, the most pain and the most public uh, whipping of the Republicans on these various things, shutdown of the parks, shutdown of the CDC, the shutdown of kids' cancer research, uh, you know, the closing of privately managed parks, and, uh, you know, the closing of the colonial farm. These are all things that have never, ever, the, the, the war memorial for the, vet, the, for the veterans, uh, the Lincoln Memorial. You know, there's a picture of the Lincoln Memorial. In fact, it was on, uh, I believe it was New York Times. They have a picture of an armed guard standing in front of the closed barriers at the Lincoln Memorial. You know, huh. normally there is not an armed guard stationed at the Lincoln Memorial when it's open. So we're spending more to shut down these highly visible symbols. And I think it's completely on purpose. You know, uh, Obama's golf course remains open, his personal golf course. His vacation retreat for weekends remains open. Um, it, 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 the Amber Alert site was shut down until there was a hue and cry. But Michelle Obama's website remains open. I mean, who exactly is deeming what's essential and non-essential here? I think as that word gets out, coupled with the debt ceiling deal and coupled with a shift in focus of the Republicans, which I agree with you 100% on, I think we may start to see a shift in public opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we will. I think we will. But I, I still think in the end it's going to be one of utter disgust at both parties, all of them. And Obama's going to take a hit, too, because he's the president. People expect him to get the thing working and fixed. And why can't you do it? And 
I think we're, I think it's just uh, another blow to the political system. Uh, it's also a great opportunity for what I hope is coming, which is uh, a third party slash third candidate to run against both parties and blow the establishment right up. Because I think that's what we really need in this country. And well, I think we, we, almost really had it. It. we almost had it back in 92 with Perot a little bit, but he was not quite right, a little nutty. We need a better, saner version of Perot with more political smarts. And I think, because that's the best thing to get our politics back working, is to, frankly, throw them all out. <laughs> and in the future, the next group of politicians will be very much more responsive to people than these arrogant jerks are. Well, not only that, I think we also need some constitutional amendments. I don't know if you've read Mark Levin's book, but, um, you know, some great ideas in it. Let's wrap up with this. Let's say there is a default. Oh. Which, oh. Yeah, right. So tell, tell the audience just a little bit about, so they can be in tune, what would happen in the event even though you and I think it's remote, that Obama gets, uh, you know, an arch up his butt and decides not to allocate the funds necessary to pay the interest on the public debt to foreign institutions and countries? Well, I think, I think, and I'm really not an expert on it, but everything I have read about that eventuality is all bad for our economy. It would put us back probably into a recession. Uh... Foreigners might even withdraw investment money from the United States, forget about buying more U.S. Treasury bills and all that. That's a whole other thing, whether they would keep doing that. Um, there'd be payback from other economies and other nations against us for doing this. China and Japan have already threatened it today. I think we could uh, lose our status as the world world reserve currency. Well, there you go. So, I mean, this is not something to be trifled with. Shutting down the government over an issue is one thing, and I could see it. I don't like it, you could, but it's not the end of the world for a while. But I wouldn't screw around with this debt ceiling thing. They had to fix it, and then – and by the way, that poll you cited, I read that thing very carefully. It's not that they don't want to raise the debt ceiling, which they don't, but they would agree to raise it, the American people, if it's coupled with spending restraint, spending yes. cuts. They exactly. like to sequester – the, pop, the politicians hate sequester, the people like it. And the same thing can happen again. We'll agree to raise the debt ceiling for another year or two, but there's going to be more mandatory cuts put in. And well, the John, public likes that kind of thing. John, thanks much for your time. It's been great. Uh, we'll Thank you, Reed. My pleasure. We'll, Let's do it we'll again. reconvene oh. here in a couple months and see how good our pro prognostications were. <laughs> I hope they're not good. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, have a Thank great you. one. All right, bye-bye. This is Reed Lance Rosenthal on the right side. That was our interview with John Labodelier, and I, you know, I just have a problem pronouncing those names. I'm sorry, folks. But he is terrific. Uh, definitely watch his show, Political Insider on Fox, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, with Pat Goodell, another who I have, think is terrific. He's a Democratic pollster. He worked for Jimmy Carter, as a matter of fact, and did some work for Clinton. So you have both views there. And Pat Goodell is one of the few honest Democrats I think I've listened to in many, many years. Um, we're going to take a little break, and when I come back, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's been going on <laughs> that the mainstream media is not covering with selective shutdowns of private businesses, private ownerships, and public institutions and lands that we own Remember, we're the owners, right? The government doesn't own the national forests. The government doesn't own the national parks. We own them, folks. We are the owners of those properties. In fact, we own the government. They are simply our managers. Since when does a manager tell an owner that the owner can't use his own property? Wait till you hear these instances which the mainstream media is not covering at all. Your eyes will glaze. We'll be right back. Land for love and money. The beauty of the land provokes something primal. It fills us with awe and makes us yearn for land of our own. 
My land, those words evoke a sense of security and a place in the world. Yet the word land also evokes nitty-gritty financial issues, business, improvement, taxes, profit. In Volume 1 of Land for Love and Money, rancher Reed Lance Rosenthal uses his award-winning style to tell us real stories, the hard-hitting truth your banker forgot to tell you about all types, sizes, and locations of land. For those drawn to land purchase, ownership, management, preservation, and sale in good times and in bad. Reed's intense love of the land, his devotion to wild and remote places, and his extensive experience with land purchase and sale throughout two continents make him uniquely qualified to write Land for Love and Money. A bestseller already, Land for Love and Money is available at landforloveandmoney.com, Barnes & Noble, Hastings, Amazon, and fine bookstores everywhere. I hope you enjoyed that interview with John. I think it gave you the big picture and tied in how international events are kind of dovetailing now with domestic events. You know, it could be shaping up to be the perfect storm. The increased cost of Obamacare, the effects, and I might add completely avoidable effects, as I'm going to discuss here in a moment, of the shutdown, what might happen with the default. I'm going to summarize this for you, and I'm going to give you a list of about 30 different shutdowns. Outrageous. Outrageous. I want you to understand something. This is a shutdown in in name and form only. Number one, uh, the government seems to be functioning and everybody can turn their lights on with 800,000 workers furloughed. That might tell you something. The EPA, as we discussed in the interview, has deemed 94% of their employees non-essential. That might tell you something. But this shutdown is manufactured, folks. I want you to know that 83% of the government is still functioning just fine. This shutdown only affects 17% of the government. I mean, that's not something that Democrats want you to know, but them's the facts, Jack. And that 17% is up to the discretion of the agencies, the departments, and the president under law. So when national parks and some of these other examples, which will just cross your eyes, when national parks are shut down, when alternative steps are not taken to ease pain for various communities, when our vets and our war dead are dishonored, this is choice. This is choice. This is not mandatory. This is not legal. It is choice. And the choice is by the Democrats in the Senate and by the President. So that we understand where we're at. And by the way, I'm going to tell you that I don't think the Republicans have handled this as they should have. Let me just say that right up front. They should have been working on this four or five months ago. They should have been focused like a laser on a delay of the individual mandate so that the folks had the same delay deferment that big business was granted unilaterally and illegally by Obama. You, you know, the president does not have the power to change a law unilaterally. The Constitution vests that power only in the House and the Senate. But putting that aside, the Republicans should have been on this four or five months ago. This should not be a last-minute thing. It probably would have come down to a last-minute thing, but at least they could have pointed backwards and say, listen, we've been working on this for the last four months or five months or six months. So I think that was a poor strategy. I think that the strategy of the shutdown itself, that could go either way. Right now, public opinion is pretty well split. More people blaming the the Republicans, but not by much. One of the things that the government shutdown tells us is that there's a lot of government we don't need. That, That scares the hell out of Democrats. The other thing that it tells us is that we have a vindictive, vicious administration who really doesn't care about the pain of ordinary people. Because in every instance where it could have alleviated pain, deferred pain, made alternate cuts, redirected funds, it has not and it has ordered its agencies and departments to not take those steps. Let me give you some examples. 
<clears throat> number one, you know, because uh, I've been talking about it in my teasers here, which you folks hear on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, you know about death benefits and travel expenses for family members to meet their dead sons and brothers and fathers in Dover. Their $100,000 death benefit, which is part of their contract with the military and with America. That was brought to the attention of Congress by the Comptroller of the Department of Defense on September 27th. On September 28th, the House passed the Military Pay Act to specifically cover that and other matters related to the military. On September 29th, magically, the Senate passed it. On September 30th, the President signed it. The DOD made no mention of the fact that they didn't think it covered those matters that they had warned of on September 27th. As we come to find out, the DOD had wide discretion in how to handle this mess, and they purposely chose Chuck Hagel and his bunch at Obama's behest to not fund these death benefits and travel expenses. Absolutely outrageous. VA hospitals have been shut down or put at half-mast, once again, covered in the Military Pay Act. Let me tell you that the House of Representatives has now passed 14 clean, partial CRs, which is the norm. Okay, There's been 27 shutdowns <clears throat> of the government in the United States over the last 30 to 40 years. None of these matters, memorials, the veterans, has ever been affected before. This is simply spite. This is simply political gamesmanship using people's lives as a lever for ideological purposes. The Military Pay Act was passed. Then the Department of Defense and Obama lawyers said, oh, well, the, the wording isn't quite right to pay these death benefits. Nonsense. Now, there's been a new CR passed, the 14th, unanimous, unanimously by the House. That means every Democrat in the House voted for it. And that was to specifically, so there could be no quibbling about the wording on what is discretionary anyway. So it would specifically fund these matters. The Senate refuses to take it up, and the President has said he will veto it. Now, you tell me who is causing the pain in this shutdown, folks. You bet. Let me give you some other examples. We have, uh, we're going to have posted on the website a video of Harry Reid saying that he doesn't care, and you can listen to it yourself, about uh, kids with cancer. In fact, he compares them to 1,100 people in his district who've lost their job in furloughs. There's a CR sitting on the desk of the Senate, Harry Reid won't move it, which reestablishes funding, which is discretionary again, for kids' cancer research. Senate won't touch it. There are also CRs, clean, no Obamacare, no nothing, sitting on Harry Reid's desk now, some of them for over a week, reopening the parks, reopening the memorials, funding the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, funding the NIH, funding intelligence operations. The Democrats refuse to even bring it to the floor. Obama has said he'll veto the bills. It is normal in the course of American politics, and the Constitution envisions a budget, which the Democrats have not passed for five years, which is then funded in up to 12 appropriation bills, CRs, if you want to call them that, over the course of a year. This is nothing new, although the Democrats try and make it new and try and make uh, the argument that we're not going to do a partial. We're only going to do the full thing. Well, that's not the way it's worked in the past. Nor have shutdowns worked this way in the past. Uh, did you know that they shut down E-Verify? That's right. Did you know that they shut down Border Patrol? Correct. You know, of course, that they shut down the memorials to the World War II vets. There's been Vietnam vets arrested at their memorial for just trying to see it. In the meantime, to show you how discretionary this is, the National Mall gets opened up 
for for a rally by illegal aliens on amnesty two days ago of course attended by nancy pelosi and and her ilk from congress waving their hands and talking about how grand it all is with hundreds of security personnel all of which cost money if you listen to nancy pelosi's video her little speech she personally thanks President Obama for opening up the mall. What kind of country do we live in where our World War II vets are denied access to the memorial? While on the same National Mall at the discretion of the President, which he has in all these matters, it's opened up for a rally by folks who are here illegally. And for all of you going, oh my gosh, he used the word illegal aliens. That's what they are. The law is what it is. Barry does not get to choose what laws get enforced or not enforced, nor make amendments to laws that have been passed as he have done, done with Obamacare. You want to talk about the real anarchists? It's the Democrats and the President. Let me give you some other examples here. <clears throat> we had the President go on, you can Google this up, uh, we'll try and have the video on the website and actually try and talk the markets into a panic affecting tens of millions of people's investment and virtually everybody's IRA and 401k that was just like eight days ago basically he said the market should be going down I don't understand why they aren't and they ought to be worried listen to the video yourself it's outrageous then we have the National Guard not being funded. Another CR, clean CR, that's been passed by the House, sent to the Senate, and sits on the desk at Obama's, uh, sits on Harry Reid's desk at Obama's behest. You know, I, I want you to know that this is probably the most reprehensible behavior I have ever seen by anyone. This, this makes Watergate... Yeah, if you couple this with the IRS scandals, this makes Watergate pale, folks. It makes it pale. Watergate was reprehensible, let's face it, but that affected very few people, really. What Obama and Reed and the Minions are doing is affecting millions, and it's intentional. Let me give you some more examples. All of these are going to be posted, by the way, on the on the right side radio dot com site, and every one of them has a site and a reference. Please see it. There's going to be some great videos, too, including Harry Reid just the other day in the morning saying about this military burial thing that the bill that was unanimously passed by the House was just a gimmick. You can watch him say it in his own words. Of course, hours later, he was passing the gimmick unanimously in the Senate, and it was getting signed by Obama, who also poo-pooed it in the morning and then reversed courses in the afternoon. Did you know that furloughed military chaplains aren't even allowed to work for free? That's right. They're subject to arrest by the military if they do Sunday services, weddings, baptisms, whatever, during the shutdown. Outrageous. I think we talked about it, and if we didn't, he shut down 1,100 square miles of the Florida coast to fishing, affecting a whole industry because it's patrolled by the Coast Guard. And then, you know, we have... Uh, his closure of 100 privately owned and managed parks, they cost no money to the federal government. In fact, several of them generate net revenues to the federal government. Remember, these people have been jumping up and down talking about how much the shutdown costs America every day, but revenue-producing, privately owned parks are being shut down or forced to shut down. Okay, Did you know that E-Verify was shut down? That's right, along with the Border Patrol. E-Verify was shut down. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> the Amber Alert site, of course, was shut down, but after a huge hue and, cry, hue and cry, that was also reinstated. Michelle Obama's site, by the way, has remained up. Then, of course, we have, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm laughing here because it's so outrageous. It's so outrageous. Um, I'm going to read you a little thing very quickly. We're going to post the whole article on the site. Pat Villancourt went on a trip last week that was intended to showcase some of America's greatest treasures. Villancourt was one of thousands of people who found themselves in the national parks. The federal government shut down, went into effect on October 1. 
For many hours, her tour group, which included senior citizens from Japan, Australia, Canada, and the United States, were locked in the Yellowstone National Park Hotel under armed guard. The tourists were treated harshly by armed park employees, she said, so much so that some of the foreign tourists with limited English skills thought they were under arrest. I mean, this is unbelievable. The bus stopped along a road when a large herd of bison passed nearby, and the seniors filed out to take photos. Almost immediately, an armed ranger came, out, came by and ordered them to get back in, saying they couldn't recreate. The tour guide, who had spent $300 the day before to bring the group into the park, the tour, the tour fee, argued that the seniors weren't recreating, just taking photos. The park ranger responded and said, Sir, you are recreating, and her tone became very aggressive, Bill and Court said. Look, folks, this is outrageous. I mean, I don't need to tell you this, right? The list goes on and on. The list will be on the website. You really need to read just how petty, how political, how uncaring the Obama administration, Harry Reid, and the Democrats in the Senate are, how all of these things could have been fixed, at least on a piecemeal basis, which, by the way, happens to be the history of the United States. Generally, there's a budget pass. Of course, we haven't had one for five years because of the Senate Democrats. And there's about 12, give or take, appropriation bills that are passed by the House during the course of a year, the fiscal year being October to October for the United States government. And those 12 appropriation bills fund various portions of the approved budget. We don't have a budget. So sending up clean CRs, having nothing to do with Obamacare, as we discussed a little bit previously, that fund the parks, that fund border patrol, that fund military burials, etc. This is nothing out of the norm, despite what the mainstream media wants to tell you. Listen, I don't know about you, but <clears throat> this stuff really pisses me off. I don't like politicians playing with people's lives for political gain. I don't like politicians that think we are so stupid as to not see through their charade. I don't like politicians who, on one hand, sign executive orders over 950 of them so far over five years, but can't, with a 10-second flourish of the pen, transport the family of dead military people who died defending us to Dover Air Force Base to receive the bodies, nor get these people what the military contract pays for, which is a burial and death benefits. And did I tell you that uh, on the first day of the shutdown, with everything else shut down, you know what was considered essential besides Sesame Street? That's right, $445 million to the National Public Broadcasting Service, who just magically, over the ensuing two weeks, gave Obama two softball puff interviews. Do you think that was any coincidence? Wow. We can't bury our military dead, but we can fund NPR and listen to the president on two cushy interviews. It is outrageous. And you, we need to make our feelings known. You need to contact your congressmen and your senators down there, particularly in Colorado, because, you know, you have Dems down there. They're all part of this mess, folks. 2014 is coming. Colorado, are you listening? They need to go away. They need to be replaced by people who really do care about the people, about the Constitution, and about America. This is Reed Lance Rosenthal. Don't miss the videos. So you can hear it for yourselves. You can watch their lips move. And don't miss the articles on this week's show on the rightsideradio.com. Have yourself a great Saturday. Have yourself a great week. For more information about Reed and his work, please go to OnTheRightSideRadio.com. There you can also click to purchase the first two volumes of his number one best-selling historical Western series, Threads West, an American Saga, and Maps of Fate. And now the first volume of his new nonfiction series, Land for Love and Money, is available everywhere, or go to LandForLoveAndMoney.com. That's Land for Love and Money. We'd also like to remind you that if you've missed any shows, you can go to the show archives on Reed's on the right side radio.com webpage. We look forward to seeing you again next week for another episode of Reed Lance Rosenthal on the right side.